What's up, guys? So we all know that boomers love emptying out their Roth IRAs to buy Gibson guitars. But is a Gibson really the most boomer guitar out there? I mean, granted, they have the Murphy Labs. They're a trillion dollars. None of us will ever be able to afford them and a house. So it's possible, but I don't think it's the culprit. I do not think that Gibson is the quintessential boomer guitar. Before we get into it though, I want to thank you all for tuning in. And if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and click the subscribe button. If you've enjoyed these videos, give the video a thumbs up. It really does help the channel grow and it would mean the most. So what is the most boomer guitar? It has to be annoying, right? I mean, boomers love being annoying, but I implore you to think like a boomer for just one moment. Put yourself in the shoes of a lowly retired boomer who all they have left is to live out their unfulfilled fantasies of being a rock star. What, what would you buy? Sure, you could go with the Gibson, but, but first you have to ask yourself, what does a boomer look for in a guitar? Well, obviously they love Gibson, so they don't want anything comfortable like a Strat. So ergonomics are out right? Uh, comfortability? <sighs> no. They, they cream their sodas for Les Pauls for a reason. They don't plan on playing these guitars. They hang them on the walls. I know I have guitars hung on the wall. I'm not a boomer. I promise. But they do love shitty designs. I mean, that that is why Gibson is a boomer lifestyle brand, right? I mean, they're not making guitars for the working musician. No, absolutely not. In fact, working musicians want something reliable, something that'll stay in tune, something that is comfortable and easy to play. Easy on the back, you know? Not a 46 pound Les Paul. Fine when it's hanging on the wall, but not when it's hanging off your shoulder, right? So the plight of the boomer is, is a lot different than that of the working musician. Yes, the working musician, if you go to any concert, you may notice a lot of vendors. They're very popular. They're well built. You can get parts easily and cheap. They're fixable. The headstocks don't crack off of them. They sound good. They're solid, stable instruments for the most part, except for the 50s reissue Telecasters, which if you haven't seen my video, Video for that. I'll link it in the description below. Go ahead and give that video a watch. Um, anyway, I digress. So that means any Strat style guitar is probably out for the boomer, right? So no Ibanezes, no Music Mans, no Shredder guitars, unless, you know, they still do cocaine. Some of them do, so who knows. But what do we see even less than Gibsons? Think long and hard about that. Rickenbackers. I mean, when was the last time you saw an up and coming band with a Rickenbacker? Let's think about it. When I first started playing guitar, as I got further into my obsession and collecting, um, I would spend hundreds of hours on Sam Ash. Yes, this was before the era of reverb and Sweetwater. Believe it or not, at one point in time, Sam Ash was king. Their website was not very good, but it existed. And they sent little booklets in the mail. So that was pretty nice. Uh, I do remember reading those a lot. And oftentimes I would look scouring through, looking at all the cool guitars that my heroes played and thinking about what my next acquisition would be. And something that always turned me off about Rickenbacker was their secrecy around the price. Oh, you have to call to get the price. Why? Why do I have to call? What? Oh, it's a secret. We can't let anybody know how much they cost. Even today, if you go online to buy a Rickenbacker, you can't just look up the price of a Rickenbacker. And boomers love that. They love playing mind games. It, it gets them off. So the fact that Rickenbacker wants to play mind games around the price of their guitars is perfect for the average boomer because they want to play mind games about whether or not their children are going to be left anything in their inheritance or if they're just going to squander their fortunes on a few less Pauls they'll never play that they'll fucking have buried with them. But I, I remember in 11th grade, my good friend Daniel, 
he bought a 4001 base in midnight blue and i was obsessed i love this base it was so badass i mean i'd seen jazz bases and p bases those were the most common especially when i started they were only about 300 dollars for a mexican so if you wanted a base you had one of those and my first base personally was an ibanez geo uh it wasn't the best base but it was a base and it got me started it got me started in my love for bass slapping and popping grooving you know it was a good time i loved playing that bass and it sounded really good it was basically just a p bass but ibanez you know same pickups and it wasn't bad it had a rosewood fretboard it was a pretty good bass overall but dan's 4001 was amazing he, he had it and the neck was so flat and so different. Really, it just looked cool, but it was never comfortable. And the pickup cover was a little cumbersome and hard to take off, especially for a couple of 11th graders who had never done any real work at the time. So using a screwdriver was far beyond Daniel or I's comprehension. Uh, I think we've come a long way since then. I know Dan, he likes to solder in pickups now and he's, he's become quite handy and so have I. But the most infuriating thing was that not shortly after he had acquired the base, he realized it wasn't all it was hyped up to be. No. So he traded it in about a week later for an EVH half stack. And that was the last time I thought about Rickenbacker for about seven or eight years. Because where do I even begin to think? about acquiring one. I can't even look up the price, you know? How much do I save from mowing lawns and doing yard work around the neighborhood? It was out of question for me. And so, out of sight, out of mind, right? And that's probably the problem that we're seeing with Rickenbacker today. Their prices are out of sight and their guitars are out of mind because nobody wants to play the mind games in 2024. But I fortunately had a good opportunity in around 2017 to acquire a Rickenbacker 360 for myself. And so I essentially got it for around $300. I had an old tape machine, a TAC 88. If you know anything about tape machines, you may have seen that. That was the tape machine that Boston used to cut their first album. And I had gotten that tape machine for around $300 on eBay and traded it to a boomer for this Rickenbacker. So it was kind of the deal of a lifetime for me. A guitar that seemed like unobtainium at the time was only gonna cost me $300. I still have this guitar to this day. Here she is. And well, what do I have to say about it? I think I'm still a little bit skeptical around the value that Rickenbacker has to offer. Uh, the neck is kind of weird and skinny. They lacquer the fretboards, which, you know, maybe in a maple, sometimes you can get away with it. But for a rosewood fretboard, it's just very weird. But boomers don't mind because they buy these guitars with zero plans to play them, right? So, I mean, we know the Beatles played them. They made great songs with them, but can we still make good songs with Rickenbackers in 2024? That's what I'm gonna set out to do today. So join me while I figure out if it's still worth buying a Rickenbacker in 2024. But before we do that though, uh, if you do like the song I make, I implore you to check out my Spotify I'll link it down below. And if you get the chance, like I said, you like the video. If you feel like subscribing, please do that. It's greatly appreciated. It does help the channel grow. And uh, I hope to see you in the next video. All right, let's get started. Just any old drum loop. It really doesn't even matter, right? What? Well, let's go with something that a boomer would like. Let's Let's make... Let's make a psychedelic song, right? Or, or something, something rock, old school. I'm just gonna find a quick drum loop that maybe might fit that kind of vibe. Uh, let, you know, something the Beatles would use, right? What would Ringo play, right? Let's, let's start with something like that. I'm going to be recording the Rickenbacker 
I'm going to be sending it through my pedal board into my 1968 Princeton Reverb. And I will be using my SE Electronics Gemini tube microphone to capture the sound. One thing I will have to say about the uh, the Rickenbacker is I haven't played it in God knows how long, and it's still in tune, so maybe it's not all that horrible. All right. All right, so I got this guitar part. It's really simple, just in C. I don't want to get too crazy with it, but maybe something that you might hear in like a Beatles song or something. I really, what I hate the most about the Rickenbacker is the Ricco sound, so to change pickups, I don't have a stereo cable. Well, I do. I just don't want to use it. And so I have to switch over here. And now I can use the other pickup. I'm just going to plug the bass in direct. This is a Fender Music Master from 1972. <laughs> Record it DI this time. See how it sounds DI over the um, over recording it through the amp. I think for the rhythm part, it sounded fine through the amp. Um, if I were to do it again, I'd probably add a little reverb, but I can add that in post, and I'll I'll mix this before so you guys can hear how that would sound. But I think I'm gonna go back to the front pickup. next time.